Anti-plutonium speaking tour, the Japanese anti-nuclear movement was trying to stop the loading of plutonium reactor fuel, and Fukushima Daiichi was my first stop. This was seven months before the catastrophe. And I actually got this banner in the south of Japan, on the south, the southern island. And two young artists, a couple, gave this to me. It says, Stop Blue Thermal, in Japanese. And I was so inspired by the movement in Japan, hundreds of thousands of petition signatures, large rallies to try to stop this. Unfortunately, um, in September of 2010, just a month after I was there, they did load plutonium fuel into Fukushima Daiichi, unit number three, which, as you'll see in some of the images, was the biggest explosion that took place there. So can you go to the next slide? And the next one? Um, somebody's going to have to do it because I'm kind of preoccupied. Um, so a lot in the news right now about Fukushima Daiichi is in regards to the Tokyo Olympic victory of 2020, or not in the news is maybe a more apt way of saying it. This is the official logo. Next slide. They won it, but there was an instant response from the citizenry of Japan, especially the nuclear refugees, all told 160,000 people who can never go home again. And so I really like this art, transforming it into the radiation danger symbol. Next slide. Uh, um, this one says political cartoons. These are two French political cartoons that have caused quite a stir in Japan, an official response from the Japanese national government protesting the appearance. Je ne parle pas le français. So, um, the one the one image uh, says, it is translated into English, and it says that the Olympics already have a pool at Fukushima. And the other one, if you can't see it, is a, a sumo wrestling match. One of the contestants has three legs, the other has three arms. So it's just interesting that the Abe administration saw fit to protest a very, you know, relatively unknown uh, satirical political magazine in France. Next slide. So more imagery, uh, an updated blinky fish with the Olympic logo. Next slide. So it just goes on and on. People are not um, happy with Abe. Next slide. Claiming to the Olympic Committee that everything is under control at Fukushima Daiichi. Everything is not under control. And just a day or two after he made that statement, which seemed to be enough for the Olympic Committee to go ahead with Tokyo, he was contradicted by a top a senior um, technical advisor to Tokyo Electric Power Company who said it's not under control at Fukushima Daiichi. And you hear that from uh, the mayors of the surrounding towns, some of which are dead zone towns where people will never go back, at least for many centuries to come. Things are not under control. And this image over here, uh, the red helmeted individual is the Prime Minister, Abe and the others are probably Tokyo Electric Power Company. And you're seeing more and more of these images of top government officials heading to the Fukushima Daiichi site to try to keep a lid on things in terms of public relations more than anything. Abe spent maybe three hours at the site, and that was some of the response was from the fishing cooperative of this area, which has been stood down ever since March 11th of 2011. No fishing taking place. But unfortunately, uh, given uh, their desperation, there's talk of five days from now doing some testing fishing, they're calling it. So they're going to start fishing and see how bad the contamination is and see if they can go forward with that. But I should add that the, uh, the food standards for radiological protection in Japan are much stronger than ours here in the U.S. or Canada. So we may be importing radioactive food from Japan because our laws and regulations allow for it. Next slide. So this is a, a grand overview of what's going on. There's so much going on at Fukushima Daiichi. You've got the, the four destroyed reactor units right on the seaside. But the issue that's getting more and more of the news coverage right now is this growing tank farm for storing the radioactive contaminated water. That's what that larger square is in the back there. And that's where the current, the most recent leaks of the last couple months have been uh, coming from. Next slide. So this was Fukushima Daiichi before the catastrophe, and I actually went with the organizers of my trip there uh, up to a park that wasn't too much further to the south of this. So I actually saw this with my own eyes about three and a half miles to the south on a big bluff overlooking the Pacific. 
Another three and a half miles to my south was the Fukushima Daini nuclear power plant, another four reactors. And what's little talked about is the fact that it got hit by the earthquake, it got hit by the tsunami, it lost uh, all emergency diesel power. Fukushima Daini, that's Fukushima nuclear power plant number two, four operating reactors on March 11th, 2011, which survived catastrophe because of a single off-site power line. So this catastrophe could have been more than twice as bad as it is because three reactors were operating at Daiichi, four were operating at Daini, and they survived because of a single off-site power line. Next slide. So these are images, iconic images of the Unit 1 explosion, which was the first one. That's uh, to your left and to your right, the, the biggest explosion of all, the Unit 3 explosion in the earliest days of the catastrophe. Next slide. Um, that didn't come through too well, but that's another iconic image of all four destroyed reactors. Incredibly enough, Unit 4 not operating also exploded, supposedly because hydrogen gas from Unit 3 flowed through common venting systems over to Unit 4, <coughs> blowing it up. Um, we'll talk more about Unit 4 later. Next slide. Another iconic image showing the rubbleized buildings. An ironic part of this is uh, Unit 2, which is the second from your right there, also suffered an explosion, but it was deep in the internals of the reactor and its containment. And so ironically enough, some of the worst radiological releases of all may have come from Unit 2, because its containment structure was severely damaged, if not destroyed, by that internal explosion. It looks largely intact from the outside. Uh, Unit 3 is a pile of rubble, and there's a lot of unanswered questions about the state of the reactors themselves in Units 1, two, and three. They admit that, it took them six weeks to admit this, but full-scale meltdowns 100% took place. Uh, damaged, if not destroyed, containment structures. And more and more experts like Dr. Arjun Makajani at Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, Arnie Gunderson at Fairwinds Associates, are saying that there's so much radiological release going into the groundwater at Fukushima Daiichi that it's very likely that the groundwater is in direct contact <coughs> with the molten pores. So it's, uh, it's yet to be seen, though, because no one can go in there, and even robots and probes break down under the high radiation level. <coughs> a lot of unanswered questions. Next slide. So this is a more recent panoramic photograph, and you can see the growing tank farm up the hillside. That is where large amounts of radioactive water are being stored. So about 400 tons of water per day are used to cool the three melted down reactors. Uh, another uh, 400 tons of water per day are flowing through the site in the groundwater, just flowing down from the mountains, heading to the ocean. And so they're trying to capture as much of that as they can and put it in these storage containers. But they've recently admitted that they are losing 300 tons per day of radioactively contaminated water into the ocean. You can see the bay right there. This is uh, despite the fact that they've created an underground wall using chemicals to solidify the ground. They were trying to hold back the groundwater from reaching the ocean because it has so much contamination in it. So they're losing 300 tons per day of radioactive water into that bay. And just in the last few days, that image of Abe at Fukushima Daiichi on September 19th, I think, he said that the radioactivity is being blocked in the bay. And it seems like an absolute lie to me, because what's happening is, yes, they do have some, some silt fences, they call them, that are an attempt to filter radioactivity out of the bay water before it goes into the ocean. But what happens is it goes into the ocean, and then it dilutes. And so if they're not detecting for radioactivity at a low enough level with their instruments, they're not going to see it because they're not really looking for it. But the contamination of the fish at great distances out into the ocean are an indication that there is flow of radioactivity. And in fact, uh, a meteorological official of the Japanese government said the only reason that the radioactivity levels are not changing in the bay is because it is flowing into the ocean and diluting with the currents and the tides, but it's being replaced each day. So actually, the level of radioactivity in that bay is staying the same. Next slide. So this is what gained news a few weeks ago. One of these uh, vertical tanks, which hold a thousand tons of water, they admitted had leaked 300 tons of water into the ground, and then likely groundwater, and then the ocean. And uh, they've announced more and more leaks from the tank farm in more recent weeks. 
including some levels of radioactive dose rate that are very high, uh, 180 rem per hour at one location, 220 rem per hour at a, another location. Various sources of these leads. REM. REM. It is a, a unit of radiological measure. And at a rate of 220 REM, you could get a fatal dose in just a few hours. If you were to stand there getting 220 REM per hour of gamma radiation from the ground, where this leak went into, and left behind enough contamination to give off that much of a dose, it would only take you three hours of exposure to be killed. And workers, in large numbers, are having to work all around the scene to try to stop the leaks that are happening, to try to stop the spills, to try to monitor the situation. So um, <clears throat> I just read some news accounts in the Asaki Shimbu newspaper, a worker who was willing to talk to a journalist, that a subcontractor who does a lot of work in the tank farm area uh, put on a raincoat over his radiation protection suit because he was dealing with a truck that was spewing water, spraying water. So he wore a raincoat and used it while, bolt, while tightening the bolts. And the worker said the reason that this, this spray was not communicated up the ladder to Tokyo Electric is the subcontractor wants to stay on the good side of Tokyo Electric. So they've kept it quiet. It's not been reported officially until this whistleblower said that he's seen this twice now, workers in raincoats being sprayed by highly radioactive water leaking out of these tanks. Next slide. This is that leak of 300 tons of highly radioactive water that was admitted to several weeks ago, um, closing the barn door after the horse has bolted. This system at the ground is a rainwater control system. They weren't counting on leaks from the tanks, but they wanted to control rainwater and let it out at the right time when they were there to monitor it for radioactivity content. Someone left this, this valve open. So that 300 ton leak first went into this basin surrounding the tank and then flowed out this open valve into the ground. Next slide. How, did, how, did, how could they not close it? How, could, like, how big was that? Uh, well, that? yeah, if you can go back, I don't know. It's not a very big valve that's shown there. So they, they only had two people, if you can believe this. You saw the size of that tank farm. Before this leak was announced, they only had two people twice a day walking the tank farm. All that they could do, really, they didn't have real-time radiation monitors on them. So all that means is all they could do is, with their naked eye, see a large-scale leak taking place or some suspicious thing like a big pool of water. But if it rained, that would conceal it, of course. So they've added to the monitoring that's going on under international pressure at this point. But you can see it's a very small valve. And is that grass at the side there? Yes, this is just a shot of the ground. And this valve was open and it let the 300 tons pour onto the ground. Next slide. So a typhoon just hit the site in recent days and Tokyo Electric admits that 1,100 tons of radioactive water uh, was released during the storm, again into the ground, groundwater, ocean. So you can see desperate attempts to uh, try to control the situation. And actually, these kinds of interconnections between the tanks are where some of the leaks have taken place at a very slow rate, but it's such highly radioactive water that the dose rate on the ground where the leak took place is, is quite high. Next slide. This is another image from the typhoon. You can see uh, just sandbags being washed away by the flood of water happening so close to the tank farm there. Next slide. Just some images that showed leaks. This is not the first leakage that's happened. Uh, in 2011, in March and April, there were leaks into the ocean. Uh, this image shows where some underground channels, these were channels used for channeling water, also for channeling electrical cables. They served as the conduits that carried highly radioactive water from the cooling, the desperate ad hoc cooling operations on the molten cores that highly radioactive water made it to the seaside and then through cracks caused by the earthquake likely flowed into the ocean. Next slide. So another uh, large scale view of 2011 leaks in, in April and May of 2011 on the seaside there. Next slide. Another image from back then showing the cracks that, that led to the leakage into the ocean. Next one. So this is another um, uh, photograph here that shows this groundwater flow going through the site. So it's coming down the mountainsides under the tank farm where it picked up that one leak of 300 tons and likely numerous other leaks that we don't even know about yet. 
uh, flows uh, not only under the reactors, but into the shattered buildings. And that's where it's picking up that contamination in the basement levels of the buildings. And they're trying to capture as much as they can and put it in the tank farm. But like I said, there's quite a flow into the ocean every day. The figure is quite astounding. It's uh, a grand total of 60 billion becquerels of radioactivity, half of it's strontium, which is a bone seeker, half of it's cesium, which is a muscle seeker, going into that bay every day. That's what the 300 tons of contaminated water has in it. 60 billion becquerels, another, another unit of radioactivity measure. A becquerel is a radioactive disintegration per second. So that's 60 billion radioactive disintegrations per second every day going into the ocean. And the, the half-lives of cesium and strontium are about 30 years. Cesium-137 has a 30-year half-life. Strontium-90 has about a 30-year half-life. Which means 30 years from now, half of it will still exist, and half will have decayed away into other things. So this is a large scale, the largest scale release of radioactivity, artificial radioactivity into the ocean in human history going on at Fukushima. Kevin, Kevin? Yeah. What, what are the tanks made of? The tanks are uh, quite shoddy, and they were thrown up hastily. Uh, the tank that leaked, and there are some 350 of these 1,000 ton tanks. They're steel, but they're not welded. They're actually bolted together. And so they have packing between the steel and they have rubber <coughs> seals. And the bolts are coming loose. That's why that one story I told you about tightening the stealing water. So they're talking about replacing the tanks with welded tanks. So in the desperation and the chaos. How thick is the steel? How thick is the steel? I don't know how thick it is. It's thin walled. It's simply for holding water but it's highly radioactive water that should not be allowed to leak, and it is leaking. Next slide. So this gives you some perspective on how big these thousand ton tanks are. You can see the people next to them. Again, the red helmets are high level government officials. The yellow helmets are probably Tokyo Electric. Next slide. Uh, you can't see it very well, but there are people scaling the side of the tank to get on top. Next slide. And you can see that they're just packing them. There are people uh, off to the, the upper right-hand side to give you perspective. They're packing these tanks in very close together. Um, they're chopping down the woods on the site to make more room for more tanks. They're actually talking about decommissioning units five and six, were, which weren't destroyed in the catastrophe, to make more room for tanks. So um, it's, it's a Sisyphean effort and a Herculean effort, both at the same time. Next slide. Um, a little humor, uh, the little Dutch boy trying to plug a hole at the Red Tulip nuclear power plant. Next slide. Uh, you can see the groundwater flow again, but this is the proposed solution to this problem, uh, which is another large experiment, really. Freezing the ground around mm -hmm. the destroyed reactor units, uh, which is going to take constant electricity, and they have electricity breakdowns all the time, disrupting cooling on the molten cores and high-level radioactive waste storage pools. So they're going to have to keep this ground frozen using electricity uh, indefinitely into the future to try to, um, to uh, flow that water around the sides and into the ocean so it doesn't pick up more radioactivity in those basement sub-levels. Sub Next slide. Now I want to transition to unit number four, which may be the other shoe to drop of all the shoes that have already dropped. Unit four again, was not operating on March 11, 2011, but exploded nonetheless from hydrogen gas that supposedly flowed over from Unit 3. I say supposedly because the first official version of what happened there was that there was a fire in the high-level radioactive waste storage pool. It had lost its water either through drain down or through boiling away, and some of the waste caught on fire. The waste pools are not in any type of radiological containment structure. All they had over them were these industrial buildings called reactor buildings, which the explosions destroyed. So at this point, and you'll see more images, if you could go to the next slide, they have taken away, this is an image showing uh, photographs, I believe from April of 2011, the state of the fuel in the Unit 4 pool. It looks largely intact. There's some debris in there. Um, that's good news, though because uh, there was fear that the whole pool had caught on fire and the waste had disgorged monstrous amounts of radioactivity. But most of the fuel appears to be intact. I think the jury's still out, though, 
as to whether there was a fire in a section of this pool, because there were walls that section off the pool. So again, we're going to have to wait years, if not decades, to know the full truth. Unfortunately, Tokyo Electric is in charge of the information flow, which is unacceptable. Next slide. Um, the thing is now that this pool is open air. It has not even a reactor building over it at this point. And there's still the danger of a catastrophic fire in the pool. The building was so damaged by the explosion that it is listing, it is bulging, and it could collapse if there's another big earthquake. So a 7.0 seems to be the figure that a lot of experts are worried about. Um, this shows here some of the, again, desperate efforts that Tokyo Electric took in the first days and weeks of this catastrophe to bolster the pool so that it simply didn't collapse. They put concrete and steel under the pool to try to prop it up. But if this whole building comes down in a quake, the pool is going to go with it. And in a matter of hours, the contents of that pool, some hundreds of tons of high-level radioactive waste, could catch on fire and simply release the contents into the environment. We're talking about orders of magnitude more radioactivity than has already been released in this catastrophe, just in that one pool. Next slide. Here are some heroes of mine. Um, on your left is uh, Matsumura, Akio Matsumura, who is a Japanese uh, diplomat. And on the right is uh, Ambassador Morata, Ambassador to Switzerland. They have raised the warning in Japan and internationally about unit number four and what's at risk there, that the waste has to be gotten out of the pool as quickly as possible before this collapse and this fire take place. And they're putting it in terms of international catastrophe. Next slide. And they have worked with people like uh, Bob Alvarez, Institute for Policy Studies, who came up with that figure of how much radioactivity is in that pool, orders of magnitude more, and have already escaped at Fukushima. And over here is an image, the tall gentleman in the middle is U.S. Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, who's now Energy Committee Chairman in the United States Senate. He went to Fukushima Daiichi in April of 2012, put on a radiation protection suit and a respirator, and toured the site which, to my knowledge, he's the only high-level U.S. government official who's done that. And he came back to the U.S. and he wrote a letter to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission chairman, the Secretary of Energy, the Secretary of Defense, and other high-level officials, and said the full resources of the U.S. government have to be deployed to Fukushima Daiichi to prevent Unit 4 from going up in flames, because we're downwind, we're downstream. And he got no response thus far. The Democrat Next slide. This is one of those images of a high-level government official, Hosono, who was Mr. Fukushima for the previous administration, before the current Abe administration. In response to all that criticism from those earlier slides, from the Japanese and from the American uh, critics, he went to Fukushima Daiichi, took a lot of reporters with him, and frightening to me said, this, this Unit 4 is, is solid, it can withstand a 6 point X earthquake. He didn't mention the 7.0 though. Next slide. This is a more recent photo. Um, they are taking the debris away from Unit 4. So you, there are some cranes up on top there. That yellow structure is the uh, reactor containment uh, pressure vessel. It's the uh, reactor vessel, the uh, primary containment. But again, Unit 4 was not operating, so there was no fuel in the core. It all went into the pool. Next slide. This is some of the work being done to try to um, prop up this building. They've, they've created a new infrastructure. And this is the crane right here being moved into place that would actually lift the fuel out. The reason they haven't been able to get the fuel out is it is high-level radioactive waste. It has to be encased in a radiation shield during that transfer down to the ground level where they put it in dry cask storage. It has to be behind radiation shielding at all times or it would kill people uh, in the vicinity very quickly, in a matter of minutes, it could deliver a lethal dose of gamma radiation. But that waste transfer container weighs about, uh, weighs 100 tons. So they had to rebuild the infrastructure of the destroyed building to be able to support all this weight. Next slide. This is another image of Unit 4, what it's looking like now. This entire infrastructure is just to hold the building up, hold the crane, and move the waste. And they're talking about starting this very dangerous procedure this November. 
And another thing I should say about this situation is I mentioned that frozen ground that has largely failed because it's just being overtopped by 300 tons of radioactive water every day going into the ocean. It has turned everything behind it into uh, kind of like quicksand to a um, greater or lesser extent. And so that's another earthquake danger is the issue called liquefaction, where the ground behaves like liquid, which could bring this building down still. Next slide. So another big issue is um, that issue of fishing to resume on a test basis five days from now. And I mentioned that Japan has a standard where food can only have 100 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium. In Canada, it's 1,000. It's 10 times worse in Canada. In the United States, it's 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, so 12 times worse than Japan. So the question is, if the, fish, if the fishermen catch fish that is worse than 100 becquerels per kilogram, will they ship it over here? That's the question. Next slide. This is a interesting juxtaposition of images for me. This is very recent fish monitoring on your left. On the right is an image from 1954 that's a bluefin tuna being tested for radioactivity after the United States exploded a hydrogen bomb uh, in the South Pacific. Uh, the meteorology didn't cooperate and it blew the contamination onto a Japanese fishing vessel called the Lucky Dragon. And one of the fishermen was soon to die from his radiation poisoning. And more died over time into the future. But their catch, some of their catch got out into the marketplace before the testing began, before they knew to do the testing. And it created a huge popular uproar in Japan who had just experienced the atomic bombings nine years earlier at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the US CIA was actually sent into Japan to calm things down. And they worked with Japanese counterparts to sell this idea of atoms for peace to the Japanese people, which uh, that's a whole can of worms itself. But it's what laid the groundwork for inherently safe nuclear power. The nuclear village of Japan, high levels of society behind it, saying that nothing could possibly go wrong until March 11th of 2011. Next slide. And this is just the final image. It shows a, a Fukushima fisherman. Uh, they have been stood down this whole time for two and a half years. And of course, many people's lives have been ruined. The dairy farmers of Fukushima, uh, the farmers of Fukushima, the fishermen of Fukushima. So for them, uh, the catastrophe has just begun. Thank you so much. Ooh.